Welcome to this first presentation in a series where we're looking at the letter that James wrote. You'll find it towards the end of your New Testament. James is a common name, but he was clearly well known to his readers. And from the way he writes, he clearly carried authority with his readers. The overall pattern of research evidence suggests that this letter was written by the younger brother of Jesus. He'd been brought up as an Orthodox Jew and he only realized the significance of who Jesus was after the resurrection and indeed there is a record in the New Testament of having met Jesus personally after the resurrection. Very quickly he became the acknowledged leader of the followers of Jesus who were based in Jerusalem and had a reputation as a leader, a peacemaker, as someone who held authority and wisdom. And literature of the time shows they had a, a terrific reputation for the quality of his lifestyle. He was martyred round about AD 62 when Roman power was weakened with a change of leadership and the Jewish authorities decided to get rid of him. The letter itself is probably written somewhere in the 50s AD. Written to scattered communities, followers of Jesus who came from a Jewish background, they were under pressure, probably economic pressure. Life was not easy. And the whole letter is underpinned by a Hebrew kind of way of thinking. That was the background of the writer. Let me just pick up one verse from chapter 1. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. James is stressing that God took the initiative. He came into our humanity in the life of Jesus. God took the initiative. Word the word translated there has nothing to do with the word meaning the Bible. The New Testament didn't exist at the time. The word there is the word that's sometimes been used by John of Jesus. It's a word that carries significance. Yes, communication. But communication that carries fundamental divine principles. God took the initiative to make himself known in the life of Jesus. Jesus is the truth. He embodies the truth. He communicates the truth. He's the word of truth. And through Jesus, we have a new start in living. Jesus spoke of the rebirth to Nicodemus. It's parallel to that. A new start in living. And the followers of Jesus would be the first the pioneers of this new lifestyle, living the Jesus way, and it was open to all. The kingdom of God, Jesus came to bring it in. He opens the door. You're welcome in. The only condition is you want to come in. There are no other conditions. I have done it all for you. And in that verse, James has encapsulated so much of the truth that is seen throughout the whole of the New Testament. God took the initiative in sending Jesus. Jesus was God in human flesh. Jesus came to reveal that truth. He said, I am the truth. He embodied the truth. He spoke the truth. He lived the truth. But we must respond to that communication, the word of truth. Responding to what Jesus has done for us. And when we're in the kingdom, the Holy Spirit can generate within us a lifestyle where we start to live the Jesus way, a lifestyle of love. But for these followers of Jesus who'd come from a Jewish background, they faced really difficult questions. They'd moved. And yet they carried with them so much of the thought forms of Judaism that James understood that. That was his background. And they were faced with how to relate their past practices to the way of Jesus. 
That was something that Paul had to tussle with as well. And you'll find records of it in the Acts of the Apostles. And yet the Jesus way is a different kind of lifestyle. And it requires a different paradigm of thinking. But these followers of Jesus, they were under pressure. How could they cope with this persecution, the tests and the trials? They were under economic pressure. These are some of the issues Jesus, that James addresses in this letter. He starts by saying, James, a servant of God. Well, that's a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Written by James, the brother of Jesus, in the early 50s. To these groups that were scattered and under oppression. They were finding life tough. And he gives instructions. How do we cope? How do we react? How do we behave under these circumstances? Now, too often the chapter 1, people have picked out a few verses here and a few verses there. It's much better to read it as a whole. And to see the holistic picture of what James was driving at. Because it all works together as a complete pattern. So let's just do that. He starts, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its works so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way the rich will fade away, even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. He goes on, <clears throat> Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly light, who does not change like shifting shadows he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created my dear brothers and sisters take note of this everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks and is intently there into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And we're going to look at this chapter as a complete unit, and see the picture it paints. But we must read it in context. It's so easy for us to rip verses out of the context, then westernize it. We're going to look at it in its context. It was addressed to specific 
people, followers of Jesus, that come from a Jewish background and they carried the baggage of that background as they were working through the implications of living for Jesus. The problem was this, the Roman authorities looked upon Christians as a kind of sect of Judaism and treated them with the same disdain. And the authorities, the Roman authorities, they persecuted people who did not conform to the patterns of the Roman Empire, which eventually led to worshipping the Roman Emperor. They wanted unity and they were terrified of sedition. So people from other religious backgrounds, particularly Jews, and Christians were lumped in with them, they were under pressure. But at the same time, the Jews resented bitterly those who had left Judaism and had left to become followers of Jesus. And they oppressed them and persecuted them mercilessly. Indeed, James was martyred at the hands of the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem. So these Jewish Christians were struggling to survive. They were being oppressed from two sides, the Roman authorities and their Jewish antecedents. Now that pattern still occurs in the world today. If you look at the land of Israel-Palestine, the Jews there regard Palestinians as all the same. In fact, if you go back to the 1940s, nearly half of the population had some token adherence to Christianity. They were not Muslims. But they were all lumped in as being Muslims and therefore potential terrorists, therefore they were harried. Still happens today. But at the same time, the Palestinian Christians were being hammered by the Palestinian Muslim leadership. So they were being oppressed from two sides. And the pressure was, is so often today economic as it was in the days of James. These Palestinian Christians, often running small businesses, these businesses were boycotted at the diktat of Islamic leadership and bankrupted. And the people there struggled just to survive and they usually had to flee. The same happens in many Islamic states today where Christians, their businesses, their shops, their activities are boycotted till they go bankrupt. They struggle to survive economically. So there's a high relevance from this background in the world today. Now, before we go any further, I want to look at two words. Words hold meaning. Now, I've had to put up the word transliterated from the Greek into the English. Parasmos. James uses that word a lot. But he also uses that word dokimion. Now, parasmos can mean two things. It can mean a test or a trial or it can mean a temptation. And in the English it's sometimes translated test, sometimes trial, sometimes temptation, but it's the same word. And we can build all sorts of empires for the English try to distinguishing this when in the original Greek it is the same word. Dechimium doesn't have a problem to the same extent, it just means a kind of testing or an experience of testing. And it can be used for things like testing a metal or testing your strength, but it means testing us too. More of the process. Now you can get confusion if we're not careful. And this is where the danger is we read Western mindsets into the original text. We've got to understand it as the original hearers would have got it. That's the question James is asking. He knew the people he was writing to. He didn't have to establish his authority. They accepted his authority. He was well known to them. What do you do? 
and imagine these hearers getting that as their opening remark. You're being hammered from every side. You're barely knowing how to survive, how to put food on the table. And he says, consider it pure joy. Now, there's the word. It's translated trials. But testing of your faith is the other word. The process of testing to see if it's going to be good enough. But there's a third word in this stretch that's caused terrible problems. Modern translations will tra translate it as mature. And that is correct. The tragedy is older translations translated it as perfect. Which is utterly misleading. It means mature in the original. Perfection is not available to us. And the text never says it. It's mature. And what James is saying is that. You're facing all these trials. All these oppressions. God can work through them. He can help you through them. And there will be benefits for you. He doesn't send them. But he can take you through. So let's look at this. There's our groups that's facing the socio-economic oppression. Imagine into modern, into modern situations the boycotting of a shop till the shopkeeper and his family are driven into starvation. That is happening today in many Islamic lands. How do you react under that situation? Now that's the normal reaction. You get angry. Totally understandable. But that's what James says. Now that's not easy to do. But joy is not the kind of frothy smile on the face joy. It's a kind of inner peace. Knowing that no matter what life throws at us, and it can be very unfair... God can take us through. And endurance means we've got a capacity which develops. We can go through with our integrity and our stability intact. It's worthwhile pondering that statement which captures the meaning of the word. And together that constitutes maturity. That's the picture James is painting. Put yourself in the shoes of the bankrupted shopkeeper. That's the modern parallel. Now James rejects that later on in the first chapter. But he discusses it further and widens it in chapter 4. That's why we have to see the book as a complete whole and not rip bits out here and there. Getting the context allows us to see what James is really trying to say. Back to our question. Another reaction is that you've probably done it. When you've been hammered over something you started to question what is God doing? Why does he allow this to happen to me? And James goes on. And he says, when you face that, ask God for wisdom. Ask God to help you understand it. But ask God seriously. Believe that he can show you. Believe that there is something that God can take you through. Oh, how often we start to question. Why doesn't God do it this way? Why does he put me through that thing? What's happening here now? Put yourself back into the shoes of the shopkeeper who's being bankrupted. What's going on? How do I feed my children? Hang on. Ask God. Trust Him. He'll show you. He'll take you through. Great wisdom in what James is saying. Put the two together. These two key questions. How can we cope when we're facing trials and tests? 
You can broaden it out from the picture of the original writers now. How do you cope when you're being hammered from every side? And how do you understand what's it all about? Why is it happening to me? All I want to do is to walk and live the way of Jesus. And James is saying, God will take you through and despite the unfairness of it, all, of it all, God can turn it to advantage for you. Ask God to understand why it's happening to you. What's happening spiritually behind the scenes. Because making sense of it allows us to cope better. That he describes as maturity that he describes as wisdom and the two are connected don't rip them apart now the problem is that we interpret maturity as just a kind of combination of age plus experience of life James isn't referring to that maturity that's my sentence to try and describe it can happen at any age from any experience we're growing to live more and more like Jesus Jesus was hammered and oppressed from every side the Roman authorities could see him as seditious the Jewish authorities saw them as a threat to their cosy religious systems misunderstood by those around and yet many of the ordinary folk responded to him. How did he react? There's our model. And wisdom we tend to think about is linked to our human cleverness. Nothing to do with that. It's a gift of God as Paul expands in detail. True wisdom comes from God by his Holy Spirit and when we ask God for the insights of what's happening and believe he's going to show it to us then there's a quiet voice within us and things start to make sense and when they start to make sense we can cope so much better. There's our little groups And you had to see through the persecution, the oppression. And then you had to understand something of what was going on spiritually under the radar. And that is how James describes it. But it goes further. James now turns to say, don't blame God. Don't retaliate. And positively seek justice, love and peace. Humanly impossible. But with God's help, it can happen. And he goes on to address that one first. Then he looks at retaliation. And then he looks at justice, love and peace, which is a theme that's continued later on in the book. You can see that there's a pattern, a coherence about the whole of what James is trying to say to us. You see, true security in life when we're under the cosh doesn't rest on that. That's what society thinks. But it's not true. The people have got nothing. But in fact they can have everything. Because they have their security in God himself. God has invited them through Jesus into the kingdom. In the kingdom their status before God is assured. They're accepted. They're adopted to be his children. We're secure as servants, slaves of the Most High God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what James had found. That's true security in life.
That's what societies think. These things give you security. Look at your television screen today and you can see that underpinning the thought forms of our culture. But all these things are passing. True security in life doesn't rest on these. Our true security rests in our knowing and understanding God's purposes and direction in life. We're secure in Jesus in the kingdom by his grace. We're free and empowered to live for Jesus, the Jesus life. And we're beginning to understand what it's all about. James captures that when he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. It's the same word as testing, same word as tempting. Under trial, because having stood the test, same word, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now there's security. God will take you through, no matter what life is throwing at you at the moment, no matter how tough it may be, God will take you through and he will turn the mess that's been thrown into your life and he will turn it to advantage for your blessing. If you don't understand what's going on, ask him. If you feel you can't cope, seek his strength and his enabling. He's there for you because your status is secure in him. And then the translators have taken the same word, but this time translated it as tempting. Now it makes a lot of sense why they've done this. But it helps us to understand to know it is the same word. Now we've got to tease this out and look at how this could possibly be. You see, you could take that passage and you could make it like that. When tested, no one should say, God is testing me. For God cannot be tested by evil, nor does he test anyone. But each person is tested when they were dra are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And in some ways that is actually a more accurate translation. Let me just give you an analogy. Think of a human parent. A human parent with their child. Now those of us who are or have been parents, we wouldn't go and test our children. But we would allow them and watch them as they go through life and experience tough situations <clears throat> where they are tested. It might be a physical test as they explore the limits of their physical strength on say a climbing frame in the back garden. Or it might be the kind of testing that they face when someone has a go at them in their early days of their school career. We don't send it we don't deliver it, but we're there for them to help them through it. <clears throat> now there's a kind of analogy and picture of what James is trying to say. Let's look at testing more generally. It's one word. It depends on the purpose of the testing. If the purpose of the testing is to make you fail, you can call it temptation. And that's what Satan's trying to do. If the purpose of the testing is to allow you to develop, like the child learning their skills in a climbing frame and what's good, what's safe, what they can cope with, or the child learning how to handle bullying in a classroom situation, then we can translate it as a trial. And God allows that to happen. He doesn't send it, but he's there for it for us in it and will explain it to us if we ask. It makes a lot more sense. You see, that's just part of being human. 
Trials and testing are just part of life. Part of it's natural. But part of it is that Satan is behind the scenes. Directly or indirectly or working through people to try and make life miserable for us. But God never ever wants us to fail and end up living the wrong way. And that's why the translators have translated as temptation. God would never do that to us. He's there for us when it is done to us. That's a different ballpark. And he always wants us. And he's always there to help us. He wants us to succeed. To grow in wisdom and maturity. Back to what James is saying. Makes a lot more sense of this in the context of the original hearers of this letter. <clears throat> Too often we say that. And what James is saying, no, that's not true. God would never do that. Totally wrong. And yet I've heard it again and again when people have faced some problem in life. Oh, God sent this to test me out. <clears throat> No, not true. God does not do that. God will never use evil, ever. Even for good purposes. God can take the evil that comes to us, the testing, the trials, the economic oppression, whatever it may be, God can take that and he can take us through it. He can be with us in it and he can turn it to advantage for our blessing but he doesn't send it he can transform us going through it and then James stresses <clears throat> what God, God does do <clears throat> God only sends gifts that are good and perfect. He's utterly reliable, dependable. God's choice of rebirth. He knows that we can't sort ourselves out. He gives us a fresh start in Jesus. He provides the means of the rebirth through all that Jesus has done for us. And he has a goal for it in our lives. And that leads one to the other. <clears throat> Try as hard as you like. You will never impress God by the quality of your living. God knows that. God knows we've messed up again and again. And God wipes the slate clean through all that Jesus did for us in his life, death and resurrection. We come into the kingdom. That's us responding to what Jesus has done for us. And then God embodies truth. Comes in Jesus. And he makes that truth in Jesus known to humanity, the word of truth. We look at what Jesus lived, what he said, what he did. That's the means of starting again in the kingdom. And God's goal? Transformation. And we want to share that transformation to wider humanity, people all around us. He chose to give us birth through the word, the word of truth, that we may be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The verse we started with that captures the whole central thrust of this first chapter. That's the goal, that's the purpose. Let's keep it centered in our minds. We come to the last stretch. James has spoken about how we are to react to this economic oppression or indeed any kind of testing or trials that life throws at us. And then he moves on how to live under it. So we're moving into the second side. And we're beginning to see that in the West. Where some people are being denied certain jobs because they stand and live for Jesus. It's unjust. It's unfair, it's wrong, it's oppression, it's a trial and a test. 
but it is common in the communist world the fascist world and the Islamic world for the followers of Jesus to live under this economic oppression where for example in the Islamic world certain jobs are denied to anyone who's not a Muslim education is often denied to Christians opportunities are often denied to Christians even meeting together as Christians is often against the law that's what James has said God can turn it to advantage even something that's not from him and unpleasant and he can guide us as to what's going on show us what's happening under the radar and he's never in the business of trying to pull us down or tempt us God is there as a loving parent to see us through to guide us to watch over us and to delight as we mature now James addresses the practicalities what do we say when we're faced with this how do we react and the last stretch deals with these issues anger isn't the answer oh yes we may feel righteous anger it's so unfair injustices are forced on us life is unfair it has been always unfair in the communist fascist and Islamic world for the followers of Jesus and is beginning to become unfair in the West but anger isn't the answer says James and he pictures this in terms of things to reject and things to embrace don't stoop to that level don't react by means of anger and retaliation it may be totally unjust what's being done to you but don't stoop to their level be positive God's there for us embrace the way of Jesus living for Jesus seek his understanding seek his strength and the key so often is look at how Jesus did it if anything was unjust ever in the history of humanity it was what happened to Jesus during his trial just ponder that Jesus went through it he understands it and he understands us when we're going through it and he's there for us to take us through it no matter what happens now that's tough I'm going to ponder it and think it through but anger isn't the answer and then he speaks about people who just listen to the word now that again is the same word it's not the Bible the different word is used to refer to the Old Testament because this time the New Testament wasn't written this is the bigger word, the word that talks about God's divine principles. The word of truth, Jesus. Don't merely listen to what Jesus is saying, what he communicated in his life. Do it. And don't lock yourself up in your religiosity. Living the way of Jesus is practical. Now let's just look at that. It speaks about looking after orphans and widows in their distress. Keeping oneself from being polluted by the world. Two sides. In the society of that day, if you were an orphan or a widow, there was no welfare state. Poverty, penury, starvation faced you straight. And these orphans and widows depended on others to help them out so in the situation we are there for those who are the downtrodden the have-nots of society those that have been treated particularly badly in our society those around about us who really are suffering possibly through no fault of their own possibly by their own errors and mistakes the addicts the alcoholics 
the prostitutes, those who've lost their way in life, look after them. And there's some wonderful Christian work going on in the West. I think of street pastors to name but one, which looks after people, just their welfare, who are in distress. Keeping oneself from being polluted by the world, the Roman Empire was a hostile world. People being forced to do things that were not of God. Resist it. This is reality. You can have a head full of knowledge, but if you don't live for Jesus, it counts for nothing. You can profess religion till it's coming out of your ears, but if you don't live like Jesus, it means nothing. And living like Jesus is hard and practical. Looking after those in society who are at the bottom of the social heap, Jesus did it with the prostitutes and the tax collectors. That was the bottom of the social heap in his day. We're not to be religious. We're to be Christ-like. Faced with oppression. In Judaism at that time, the religion had been reduced to a kind of performance. And the Pharisees had said, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. It was all negative. And when some of these Jews became followers of Jesus, they were attacked by the authorities that were the Roman authorities. They were oppressed by the Jews, often economic oppression. How do you react? That's the context and that's why James wrote the letter. He sees six dangers and you can see them today. Don't just end up with an intellectual system. Religious, but doesn't affect life. Don't see yourself as superior. You've got it right and all the rest have got it wrong. Don't just make your religion something that gives you personal spiritual gain, a kind of your meal ticket to heaven. Don't build it around performance, which is what we've done in our churches so often today. Don't fight back when the injustices face you. And don't just retreat into your religious ghettos. Here in this first chapter, James addresses real problems of the first century, problems that are still there for us today.